house of the Lord. Brother Eli, would you collect the Sunday school off the plate this time? Habakkuk and the book of Psalms. 
Now that word occurs 71 times in the book of Psalms itself, so we aren't going to dive into every single verse, but in the book of Psalms, it means slightly something slightly different. It does not refer to the rock city or a city in general, but it means a pause. So when we're looking at a psalm, and we're going down through, and we see the word selah, it means to pause, to take a moment, to take a breath. Why would the writer of that psalm put that in there? Because it is instruction on what to do when you're playing this song or singing the song. That there's a pause here, there's a break there. I mean, it's no different in our own um, culture that we have when we go through a song, you know, there's a bridge and this happens, or you might supposed to be repeat this word. That is exactly what the word seal is doing. It is giving instruction on what to do during the song. Now we're going to look at one last Hebrew word today, and we're going to, and it is sheminit. It occurs in three verses of the entire Bible. First Chronicles 15, 21, Psalm 6, 1, so it would occur in the header of Psalm 6, 1, and I will go ahead and read that one. Psalm 6, 1, to the chief musician on Neganah. String instruments upon Sheminet. Eight octa is what I have in my quotations. A psalm of David. So what is Sheminet? It occurs only twice in the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 6 and 1 and Psalm chapter 12 and 1. And according to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, the Hebrew word means an eight-string an eight lyre is what Strong uh, tends to lean towards. This Hebrew word was translated Sheminit every time in the Bible. So unlike praise and selah, where it might have a slightly different Hebrew word to go along with it that would give it a different meaning that it was translated for, Sheminit, every time it is mentioned in the Bible, is translated the exact same way. And according to the Targum, it was an instrument that sounded an octave. Scofield claims that it was a male choir. However, most agree that this was actually an eight-string instrument that could hit the octave note, which when we come back to Hebrews, uh, Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, is why they said an eight-string lyre. So it's probably an eight-string instrument that could hit the octave note. Now today we are going to be looking a little bit throughout the book of Psalms and be all over the place. We're not going to pick one like we have in the past. And the reason for that is we're about to start studying the three or three of the most important Psalms that there are in the entire book, at least that I consider the three most important, or three among the most important, I should say. And that would be Psalms chapter 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24. Can anyone tell me what's so special about these three Psalms? What's so special about Psalm chapter 22, 23, and 24? Well, let me ask you this. What's being discussed in Psalm 23? That is probably the most familiar psalm of them all to begin with. The Lord is my shepherd. And what role is that portraying Jesus Christ as? What office is it portraying, I should say? Our protector. It is portraying him as our protector, but there are three main offices that Jesus Christ has held, is holding, and will hold. Our leader? Not our leader. Okay. He is going to hold the office of king, but that's not found in Psalm 23. Do you know what Psalm that is found in, brother? That's fine. We'll talk about that here. What's that? It is... Psalm 23 is portraying Jesus Christ 
as our priest. The three offices are prophet, priest, and king. Why would we look at Psalm 22 then? Why would that be important as well? If they all deal with Jesus Christ's offices, if Psalm 23 is dealing with him as his and him in, at with Jesus Christ in his role as office, his office as um, priest, then what office is portrayed is Jesus Christ portrayed in, in 22? There's only two other options. It is prophet. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, he was in the office of a prophet. He was not in the office of the priesthood hood yet because that did not come into place until after he died on the cross. Then he transitioned into the office as, our, as priest because we know he is our high priest that goes before the throne of God right now. And Brother Eli already mentioned his office as king, but that does not occur until Psalm 24. So when we look at Psalm 22, 23, and 24, they are all dealing specifically with Jesus Christ. And more specifically, they're describing him in his three offices. That are prophet, which he was portraying when he was on this earth. His office as priest, which he is portraying right now at the right hand of the Father. And 24, the office of king, which will come when he comes back with ten thousands of his saints after the battle, or I should say at the battle of Armageddon. And he takes um, his stronghold take care of the enemy there, and sits down on the throne of his father, David. So when we look at Psalm 22, 23, and 24, they are very important because they relay the office of Jesus Christ as prophet, priest, king. Each chapter takes a special note and is dedicated to each office. But not only that is that, but they are sequential. They come in order, 22, 23, and 24, and they come in a timeline of fashion and the fact that they portray which office he is playing in the exact order as well. He first goes off as prophet in 22. He is now our high priest in 23. And he will be our coming king in 24. The book of Psalms itself is extremely prophetic. But before I go there, would someone please read Luke 24 and verse 44. Luke 24 and verse 44. So there's nothing like having a New Testament confirmation that this is what the Old Testament was saying. We talked about that, I think, last week, if not uh, the week before, when we were using examples from the New Testament to confirm that this is what happened in the Old Testament. We've done that through, as we've gone throughout the chapters. But here at Luke, Jesus Christ is clear that the book of Psalms speaks concerning him as well. When David wrote, David was a very prophetic writer. He may not have known what he was writing at the time. Maybe he did. I don't know. Maybe the Holy Ghost did reveal it to him. But we know that the words that he penned could be very prophetic at times. And we'll see that here going through because we will be bouncing back and forth between the Old Testament and the New Testament quite a bit when we get a little bit farther. Some say that Christ quoted it from the book of Psalms just as much as he did due to okay some say that point twice Christ quoted from the book of Psalms because that this book had a tremendous influence in his life in general personally I believe that Christ probably quoted from the book of Psalms not just because of the influence it had upon his life, but because he knew who it was speaking about. When we look throughout the life of Christ, he brought out many things throughout different books of the Bible, of the Old Testament, to show that this was proph prophecy right now, but this is the fulfillment of it now. 
When we look at Christ using the Psalms itself, we know that they speak of him as well. I know that didn't quite make sense, but when Christ, Christ spoke in the Psalms, it was basically making an explanation of, this is what it's saying, but this very day you're seeing it fulfilled within me. This is what's happening, so you know what's going on. If we break out our Bibles, and we'll be hopping back and forth all over the place. But if someone would please find Psalm 26, Psalm 26, and verse 8, and while you're there, read Psalm 27 and verse 4. So Psalm 26 and verse 8, Psalm 27 and verse 4. Lord, I have loved that have the nations of thy house <laughs> a place where thy honor dwells. What's the other one? 27 and verse 4, please. One thing have I desired of thy Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of thy Lord and in the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And you don't have to turn there, but for, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 49 is where we find the comparison of this. Or the explanation. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 49, where the Bible states, And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? So when we're looking at this, we find that Jesus Christ had a revealed knowledge. He also quoted from Psalm 28, 2. Psalm 28, 2, if someone would please find that. And Psalm 6, 8. Psalm 28, 2. Psalm 6, 8. With the voice of my supplication when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward the holy portal. And what about Psalm 6 and verse 8? Depart from me, all you work in the iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. And then we know that these verses that Christ used specifically on the, in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 35, the Bible reads, Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And then in Matthew 7, 23, the Bible states, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Um, we know he cited Psalm 78 and verse 2 when teaching the multitude. Psalm 78, 2. If someone would please find that. 78, 2. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter days, dark savings of old. Is that it? That's Psalm 78 too? Yeah. Okay. And then Matthew 13, 35. He's jumping around. Yeah, I'm jumping all over the place. It's hard to keep all of them straight. Um, but in 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was broken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundations of the world. We know that Christ also quoted from eight, Psalm 8-2 while he was cleansing the temple. Psalm 8-2. If someone would please get that. Out of the mouth of babe was up and hence thou art gained strength because of thine enemies, and thou mightest, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. And in Psalms chapters, um, in Matthew 21 and verse 16, so the last may be, shall be first, and the first last. For many are be called, but few are chosen. Then he quoted from Psalms 18, 118, 22, and 23. If someone would please find that. Psalm 118, 22, and 
chapter 21 and verse 42 Jesus saith unto them did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner that this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes we know Jesus borrowed language from Psalm 91 and verse 4 when he wept over Jerusalem if someone would please read 91 4 
from the book of Psalms itself. Now, he quoted from the book of Psalms to show that the book of Psalms is the word of God and that it was prophetic. Now, when we look at it as well, and study it out in a little bit more detail, the book of Psalms was a lot more prophetic than we would come to realize because the book of Psalms actually predicts the life of Christ as well, happenings that will occur throughout it. If someone would please find Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9, Psalm 41, 9. Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9. Yea, my own familiar friend, and whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, have lifted up his heel against me. We could also turn to Psalm chapter 55 and uh, go through uh, uh, verses 12 through 14, but for the sake of time we won't. But his own friend had forsaken him. In Matthew 10, chapter Chapter 10 and verse 4, the Bible states, Simon the Canaanite and Judas the Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So when we look at the book of Psalms, it predicts that Jesus Christ will be betrayed by someone close to him. We know that Jesus Christ was betrayed by the Jews and the Gentiles. Would someone please read Psalm 2? Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Mark 3, 6. And the Pharisees went forth straightway and took counsel with the Herodians against how they might destroy him. And I just want to read one more passage concerning this because it brings it out in detail. Acts 4. The Bible states, Who by the mouth of the servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So he was betrayed by the Jews and the Gentiles. And if we really, really wanted to go on looking at one more verse of the Jews betraying Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have to go far because in the recesses of our minds, we can hear them rejecting Jesus Christ and the phrase, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They betrayed him. Jesus Christ was mocked while he was on the cross. Which Psalm, please find Psalm 22, 7 and 8. Psalm 22, 7 and 8. In Mark 15, 31 and 32. Likewise also the chief priest mocked and said amongst themselves with the scribes, he saved others himself he cannot, let Christ the King of Israel descend down from the cross that we may see and believe, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. We know that he was crucified as a thief. We saw, someone please read Psalm 22 and verse 16. Psalm 22 and 16. So he was crucified as a thief before.
Hold on, I just got myself lost. And in Luke, what verses did you, what did you just read, brother? Psalm 22, 16. Okay, that's what I thought. Sorry, I got myself all confused and back into the point. Oh, yeah. I have my notes in front of me, so I have no excuse. I didn't get time to print them off today for you guys. 23 and 33. And when they were come to the place that is called Calvary, they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. So he was crucified as a thief. Still in Psalm 22, verse 16. Could you please read that one more time, brother? I just want to bring out the tail there. They pierced his hands and his feet. That's pretty descriptive saying what's going to be done to the Messiah that's going to be crucified. But in Luke 24, 39 and 40, the Bible reads, Behold my hands and my feet, that is, I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone. As we see, we have, we have, and when they had, when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. In Psalm chapter 69 and verse 21, if someone would please read Psalm 69 and verse 21. I did not write the fulfillment of this, but we do know this from the um, crucifixion and the account itself. But Psalm 69 and verse 21. It predicts that Jesus, the Messiah will be offered vinegar. They gave me also gall for my meat and in my thirst. They give me vinegar to drink. And they offer vinegar to Jesus Christ while he was on the cross. Then we get to Psalm 34, verse 20, where we know that the, where it predicts that not a bone of the Messiah will be broken. So what does Psalm chapter 34 and verse 20 say? He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. In John chapter 19, verses 33 through 36, the Bible states, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came out, blood and water, and he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, that he knoweth that he saith true, that he might believe. For these things were done, and the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him should not be broken. And also we find another fulfillment of scripture. Let me see if it's in our notes or not. It is. So the next one we have, Psalm 22 and 16 and 17. If someone will please read that. Psalm 22, 16 and 17. Those me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all, all my bones, they look and stare upon me. <clears throat> It doesn't go into detail on that verse. I was there is a verse in Zechariah twelve ten, but for the sake of our study, I've been trying to stick with just the book of Psalms because that's what we're focusing on. But we find the fulfillment that Jesus Christ's side was not pierced in John nineteen and verse thirty seven, and we know it's prophecy because it's mentioned that it was prophecy. And again, another scripture saying. So what's another scripture saying? That means that it was already predicted. Years and years ago, this is prophecy being fulfilled. They shall look on him whom they pierce. So we know that Jesus was pierced, his side was pierced. And then we have to go to Psalm chapter 16 and verse 10 because it tells us what's going to happen to Christ's body. Psalm 16 and verse 10. Someone have Psalm 1610. Thou will not leave thy soul in hell, 
He was in paradise for three days. And thou shalt not see thy holy one to see corruption. What does it mean for thy holy one to see corruption? What do we have that is corrupted already? What's that? No, not the government. The government is, isn't that what you said? The government is extremely corrupt, but no. God is not talking about leaving the government in hell. You won't see him this week, see corruption. There's something that every single one of us has. It is considered the largest organ of our body. Our skin is our flesh, our bodies. There's coming a day when this corruptible shall put on incorruption. That is exactly what this verse here is referring to. That the Messiah, his body, would not be dead long enough for it to decay. It will not see corruption, but rather it will be incorruptible and it will be changed. And what happened on the third day? Christ was in the tomb. He rose again. And what kind of body did he have? His glorified body, an incorruptible body. In three days, did his body really have time to really decay or anything like that? It did not have any real time to decay. It needed a little bit longer. Otherwise, when Lazarus came forth, if Jesus didn't do another miracle, which would have been a complete restoration, he might have been coming out missing an ear or something. But Jesus Christ did not see corruption. His body did not return to the dust. And then we have the prediction on the deity of Jesus Christ, the fact that he was God. If someone would please find Psalm chapter 45 and verse 6. Psalm 45, 6. My throne of God is forever and ever. The of his king, kingdom is a right sense. And in verse, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne of God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Then we have the fact that Christ was betrayed and that he was also the foundation of the church. Is someone please read Psalm 41 9? Psalm 41 9. And Matthew 27 and verse 46, where the Bible reads, And about a ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Hello. I'm wondering if I put down the wrong passage there. But it does be, talk about Jesus Christ being the foundation of the church. I think we've already read that this, earlier this morning when we talked about did we read the verse where it said that he was the chief cornerstone? The stone which the builders rejected? That is Christ being the foundation of the church. We have prediction of the ascension of Jesus Christ in Psalms chapter 68 and verse 18. Psalm 68 and verse 18, if someone will please read that. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, where the Bible reads, Where he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he is ascended, but what is it? That he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. And then finally, we have the prediction of Christ's reign as king in Psalm 102. 24 to 27. Psalm 102, 24 to 27. Someone would please read that. Psalm 102, 24 to 27. Instead of my God, take me down away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old has thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy name. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and the vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. 
And then Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Thou sh they shall perish, but thou remainest. They and all shall wax, go, wax old as just a garment, and as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and the years, and thy years shall not fail thee. So the reign of Christ, he will reign forever. The, the heaven will wax old, they will perish, they will go away like a garment. We know that they will be burned up by fire. But the reign of Jesus Christ will last for all eternity. When we look at the book of Psalms, like I said, we're getting ready to look at th uh, three of the most important psalms throughout the entire book. Psalm chapter 22, 23, and 24. They describe in detail the offices that Christ will hold. They describe him in his office as prophet in Psalm 22. The chapter that 500 years before the crucifixion was ever invented, it was described in detail in Psalm 22 and the death of the Messiah. We will see the, the role, the office of Christ described in Psalm 23 as prophet, as priest, I'm sorry, as priest, where he is the one who leaves the sheep and guides them and makes sure that they're safe and secure. He does that as our high priest at the right hand of the Father. And then finally, in Psalm 24, we'll conclude in weeks, we'll look at him in his role in the office as king, which is yet to come, when he comes back at the end of the tribulation period and sits down and rules from the throne of his father David there in Jerusalem itself. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point in time? Yes? I want to wish you a happy birthday. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody want to add anything else? <laughs> Get old. That's where we're going with some of this mis uh, confusion today. That's it. It's old, old age. But if not, let us bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns one high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, right and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, Lord, and the Holy Ghost may have his way here today, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead us in songs and have us to sing, as they praise you upon the strength instruments in the book, Lord, Lord. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be proud that they would be good soil, that your word may follow, Lord, that you may deal with us, Lord, and guide us, Lord. May we worship you in all holiness and fullness, Lord. May we worship you with everything we have, Lord, this very morning, not because of who we are, but because of who you are, Lord. We give you all praise and glory and honor, because you alone are holy and you alone are worthy. Bless our pastor family as we give praise and honor this morning, Lord, and lift them up, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would give them a special blessing, Lord, and that you would bless them like never before. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.